Howdy, howdy. Um, so this will be our first lecture in the next unit, which is on toxicity and water pollution. And we will focus in, for the most part, on the Chapter 7 material, um, which deals with human health and environmental toxicology. So we're going to start tying in some of these uh, persistence and biomagnification and bioaccumulation principles we've talked about uh, briefly in other units, okay? But we're going to delve into those a little bit more intensely in this chapter, all right? Uh, so when it comes to linking specific pollutants to um, to disease, right, it, it's difficult to do because because many of the illnesses that may or may not be caused by pollutants, are, they, they mimic uh, symptoms of other illnesses that are not necessarily caused by pollutants, right? And uh, things like persistence and bioaccumulation and biomagnification uh, make it difficult because maybe in the studies of pollutant we realize that, oh, in this concentration it's not exactly harmful, but it's difficult to trace through like real chronic exposure and long-term exposure because of these principles. And we will talk about what we mean by each of those here uh, next, but I just, just wanted to make that clear from the get-go that many illnesses, diseases, cancers, etc., that may be linked to specific pollutants aren't necessarily uh, that easy to trace, okay? Uh, so let's talk about persistence first. Okay, um, so some chemicals, particularly our synthetic chemicals, uh, when they get out into nature, they don't break down very easily, all right? Um, and so like DDT, for example, which we brought up back in our pesticide unit, is a synthetic chemical, and nature is not very good at dealing with chemicals like that, all right? And mostly because the natural decomposers have not evolved a way to break it down. It hasn't been part of their, their natural selective process, right? Uh, so when we have persistent chemicals that nature is not good at processing or dealing with, uh, we can run into a process called bioaccumulation. All right. Uh, so the diagram down here shows the fish, and the little red dots represent uh, bits of pesticide that get into water. Okay. Now, uh, because nature does not break them down very well, what can happen with some of these persistent chemicals? is as the fish brings water into its body through its natural processes, it'll expel a lot of that water, but some of those persistent pesticides remain in the tissues of that fish, right? And that causes, okay, um, so that is the bioaccumulation process. When we move up the food chain, we have what's called biological magnification or biomagnification. So essentially what you have to understand is it accumulates in the individual organism, to a higher concentration than its surroundings, all right? So let's say we have a particular chemical that's at an unharmful amount in water, right? Uh, the, that amount can increase as we work our way up the food chain, okay? And so if you go from the water up to algae, for example, that increases because it bioaccumulates in the algae. Now, when something eats the algae, that higher concentration bioaccumulates and maybe the primary consumer to a higher degree, and so on up. So biological magnification shows what happens when we have a bioaccumulating toxin as you move up the food chain. The, the concentration actually gets higher, so it kind of creates that uh, inverted biological pyramid. You know, normally we think about things like energy and, and biomass and numbers decreasing up the food chain, Persistent chemicals actually increase as you move up the food chain. All right? So, um, again, part of the reason it's so difficult to determine health effects of pollutants, all right, but that the branch of science or medicine that determines health effects is called toxicology. Okay? And toxicology is... Um, so... A toxicology is the study of the effect of toxicants on the human body. When we talk about a toxicant, we're referring to a specific chemical that is known or might be known to have adverse human health effects. Uh, so acute versus chronic toxicity are referring to uh, effects that occur right away from a single exposure. That's acute. Chronic refers to the effects that are over long-term exposure, and it's the chronic effects that 
uh, that are the most difficult to trace because, again, symptoms often mimic other diseases, and so it's really hard to assess in a specific source for that. Okay? Um, now, often we're not just exposed to a single toxin or a single pollutant, and so there are also uh, other uh, effects when we mix things, right? So there's sometimes what we call an additive effect, right? So each chemical adds its own properties individually. So um, now, excedrin, of course, I mean, you could, I guess you could overdose on excedrin, but it's not necessarily a toxicant, all right? So excedrin makes use of things, uh, many different additives. It's, it's a great headache medicine because it really has three main components. It has caffeine, which dilates your blood vessels. It helps blood flow. It has uh, uh, acetaminophen, which is Tylenol, which is a painkiller. And it also has aspirin, which is a blood thinner. All those things contribute their own property, but they all work together to, to help a headache, okay, which is why it works so well. Okay. Uh, interesting side note, if you get Excedrin versus Excedrin migraine, it's the exact same thing. They just charge you a dollar more for it. So don't fall for that. Read their ingredients. Uh, next, we have what's called synergistic properties, in which case uh, when you mix two chemicals, they, they multiply each other's effects. All right. So an example of that would be uh, alcohol and THC, right? So when you drink alcohol, obviously alcohol has certain effects. Uh, THC is the intoxicating chemical in marijuana. Uh, when you mix the two, they actually uh, increase each other's effects. And so when it's additive, you think of one plus one equals two. With synergistic, it's a relationship where one plus one equals three, where the two together actually have a greater impact than the sum of their parts. All right, and then some chemicals are actually antagonistic, where one uh, might reduce the effects of the other. Okay, in which case, you know, you could picture that as one plus one comes out to not two, but one point three, because they they work against each other instead of in synergy. Okay, uh, now how all those chemicals play out in nature and so on again, it's a very difficult task to 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 map out. But these are three potential relationships when we have a mix of toxicants. All right. So toxicity. All right. Uh, toxicity is measured by a dose and response relationship. All right. So the dose refers to the amount that enters the body of the exposed organism. And the response is the amount of damage caused by a specific dose. And most toxicology uh, radians are written in, as what's called an LD50, right? So LD stands for lethal dose. And so an LD50 level is the dose or the amount, okay, uh, that is required to kill 50% of a test population, all right? Now, in defining LD50, the fact that it's a test population is really important because it's under control conditions. It doesn't always play out exactly like that in nature, by the way. All right, so um, it's the dose that's lethal to 50% of the test organisms. All right, and so the smaller the LD50 level, the more toxic or the more lethal that chemical is. That just means it requires less to kill the organism. That makes it more toxic or more lethal. All right, uh, all new synthetic chemicals, uh, they will determine an LD50 level. And of course, they're not going to test it on humans. They're going to test them on other things to determine that LD50 level and extrapolate that out uh, based on the mass of humans, okay? Uh, so if we look at some various uh, chemicals, right, drugs and over-the-counter type things versus nasty stuff, we can look at their LD50 level. So aspirin is lethal. It just takes a pretty high dosage to be lethal, lethal. okay? Uh, whereas something like nicotine, which, uh, you know, is the, the addictive, one of the addictive compounds in tobacco, is extremely, extremely toxic. Uh, just lucky that in tobacco it's, it's only available in such small quantities. All right. Uh, you could look at the lethal dose of caffeine or heroin or lead or cocaine, etc. Right. So, uh, remember the lower the LD50 level, the more toxic the material that we're talking about. Okay. Um, now, ED50 is another way of measuring uh, toxicity, and, and it may not be 
necessarily toxicity, but ED stands for effective dose. And so maybe they're looking for not the, the, the level that's going to kill 50% of the population, but maybe they're looking for a specific uh, outcome. So maybe uh, it's, it's something like a, a painkiller, and they want to know the, the dose that's going to alleviate pain for 50% of the population. That would be the effective dose. Okay, so they're not always studying the lethal dose. Sometimes they're looking for other, maybe, uh, effects of that drug. Okay, uh, but both of them would be measured, and this is the final piece of today's lecture using what's called a dose response curve. Okay, um, and in the saltwater toxicity lab with the mung beans, that's what you guys are creating. You're creating a dose response curve using that semi log graph paper uh, that I introduced you to you guys to the other day. Okay, um, and so a couple of things we'll point out, and I'll show you some examples of dose response curves. But one of those items is what's called threshold level, and that's the maximum dose where you see no uh, correlatory effects, right? So there's no change in the population compared to a group with no uh, exposure, right? So that's that threshold level. And we'll show you what the ED or LD50 level looks like on a dose response curve and what the threshold level looks like. All right, so if we look at the, so this x-axis is our logarithm of the dose, right? So that's using that semi-log graph paper. The y-axis is the percent, and that's your traditional scale, okay? Uh, so the threshold level is shown right here. So we notice that between this dose here, x and, and x2, x1 and x2, there's no measurable change um, in the, the population. Right, so the maximum dose, right there, that shows no effect on the population is called the threshold level. After that threshold level, we do start to see some sort of impact on that population. All right, so there's our threshold level would be whatever this dosage is on the um, x-axis. All right, so the ED50 or the LD50 level is wherever the 50% line intersects your dose response curve, right? So when you guys do your graphs of uh, uh, the, the effect of the salt water on uh, the mung bean sprouts, you're going to look for where 50% intersects the line that you guys draw, connecting your data points, right? And that would essentially be your LD50 level concentration for salt water on mung beans, okay? Um, and sometimes it's helpful to... Um, show two side by side, two different toxicants to determine which is uh, more toxic, okay? So uh, you notice toxicant B shows a lower threshold level, but a higher uh, LD50 level, okay? Whereas toxicant A has a relatively high threshold level, but once you get past it, it skyrockets up to that 50% mark, okay? Uh, so you guys will be generating those, and we'll also get some practice working with them as well. All right, uh, that does conclude the lecture for today. All right, so you guys will have some follow-up assignments to uh, work your way through and process some of this information.